You are listening to Mining Stock Education, where you'll learn from the top leaders in the natural resource sector and uncover quality mining investment opportunities. Thanks for tuning in to Mining Stock Education. I'm your host, Bill Powers. Joining me today is the president and CEO of Silver One Resources, one of our sponsors and a company to whose projects I visited in 2019 in Nevada. They also have projects in uh, Arizona. So they're located in the two top jurisdictions of mining worldwide, two of the top jurisdictions. Greg, welcome back onto the program. Uh, For YouTube listeners, you're seeing the PowerPoint presentation pulled up. Uh, Greg's gonna be walking us through some of the key updates and what to expect over the next several months. So please take it away. Sure, Bill. Well, always a pleasure to talk to you. And uh, post-COVID, hopefully we'll get you out to the site again so you can see some of the uh, advances that we've made over the last little bit. And plus, we do have two other exciting projects, one in Nevada and, as you mentioned, one in Arizona as well. And just to refresh our readers what I'll, or our listeners, what I'll do is I'll just go over some of the more recent updates. And those of you familiar with the company, when we started the company in mid-2016, we had acquired three Mexican silver assets from a company called First Mining Finance, which is one of the companies in the stable of companies run by a fellow by the name of Keith Newmeyer. He also has First Majestic with operating mines in Mexico, $2 billion plus market cap company. Uh, that being said, we've recently announced the sale of those three Mexican silver assets so that we could concentrate on our more advanced projects in Nevada and Arizona. That uh, injected an extra 1.25 million into our treasury. We anticipate getting another 1.25 million in about uh, 18 months. And then on top of that, we also secured about 4.3 million shares in a newly listed silver company. And in the current silver environment, of course, Um, uh, we have uh, uh, seen uh, a very good, uh, shall we say, health behind a lot of these newly listed silver companies. So we're looking forward to uh, that being an additional cash uh, injection into the company down the road. But uh, that being said, we're currently concentrating on our advanced uh, Candelaria uh, asset. There's a shot coming up on the screen. This is the past producing Candelaria mine in the state of Nevada. Two big open pits and two big uh, heap leach pads. I'm going to talk about the progress that we've made on this project. Despite COVID, we've been very active and very fortunate that we have a lot of uh, local talent that's been helping us out. And uh, we've also advanced our other two projects, and I'll talk briefly about those. Um, This is the site that uh, Bill visited in 2019 that he talked about and Uh, There is a video on our website at www.silverone.com with Bill as presenter and uh, myself showing Bill around the project. So uh, have a look at that if you haven't already seen it. So I'm just going to flip through, you know, a bit of the PowerPoint, and uh, we're going to jump right to Candelaria. Candelaria, of course, was an extremely high-grade producer back in the early days, started in 1864. Uh, Up till 1959, it produced on average at 1,250 grams per ton silver. It was one of the highest-grade producers in the state of Nevada. Then it switched to open pit mining. Kinross was the last big miner, and they shut it down in 97, sold it off to Silver standard. They did some studies, but with silver prices languishing under $5 per ounce, they uh, went on to other projects, took the company in a different direction, and we did a deal with them in late 16, early 2017 to be able to acquire a 100% interest with no uh, royalties back to SSR, which was the new name of the company when they changed direction. Uh, Big historic resource. We did a big drill program uh, on the heaps back in 17 and 18. We put out an updated resource just last year. And those two big heap leach pads that you saw in that first photograph um, are estimated to contain about 30 and 15 million ounces of silver, uh, uh, respectively, at an average grade of about 42 grams per ton. Now, we've been doing a lot of metallurgical sampling on these heap leach pads. And more recently, we entered uh, into a 15,000 meter uh, reverse circulation uh, program. And there are a couple of things that came out of that that are extremely important in uh, respect to our moving the project forward. First of all, 
the uh, open pit mineralization does extend beyond the old open pits. We've traced for about 500 meters or about uh, 1,500 to 2,000 feet to the west of the uh, one of the big open pits and another 100 meters to the east. That doesn't cut off. We just haven't drilled beyond that. Looks like good grades are extending. And also down dip on the northeast side, we're finding some very high-grade intercepts, some of them that we just uh, released uh, with our uh, last round of assays that we received values up to 1700 grams per ton silver and two and a half grams per ton gold over one and a half meters within about an eight meter wide interval of grades that might be amenable to underground mining. So we're starting to outline a zone down dip, much higher grade that could be accessible by ramping down from the base of the pit. In the meantime, what we're doing for the rest of this year is we're gonna continue on uh, uh, drilling an additional drill program. We just completed that 15,000 meter program. And as soon as we get the rest of the results back in the next few weeks, we'll design the next program. And then we will also be doing metallurgical testing on both the fresh material marginal to the two big open pits and the heap leach material with the aim of putting out an economic study by the end of the year for potentially mixing the fresh material with the heap leach material to increase grades and recoveries and then start potentially processing silver from that mixed material as soon as we uh, can, shall we say. Now, the advantage to this project over other projects as well is something that's important, is essentially permitting. Um, Kinross essentially had all the permits in place, and those permits haven't gone away. Uh, they just need to be updated. And we've had discussions with both the BLM and the Nevada Department of Environmental Protection. They have all said that um, essentially this is a disturbed site that hasn't been fully reclaimed, and that the these permits would need updating, not starting from scratch, which generally takes uh, four to five to 10 years to uh, go through the process. Uh, they told us that they envisaged that uh, we would get a review in a matter of months, not years, which is extremely encouraging. So we need to get our economic study out and hopefully we will be able to do that uh, by the end of the year. Now, there's one other aspect of um, Candelaria, which is important as well. And um, that wasn't really talked about historically, because historically, all they did was really mine the near surface silver oxide mineralization. So we're finding extensions to that. We're finding down dip higher grade material, but we're also finding sulfide silver at greater depths, which is something for future consideration. But there's another type of mineralization that nobody has really spoken about much, and that's just over by the Georgine pit. On some of the um, historic dumps outside some of those old adits that date back to the 1800s, we're finding material that looks uh, like an altered uh, intrusive porphyritic rock. And it's shot through with a mineral called chalcopyrite, which is a copper bearing mineral. Now, analyzing some of this material off the old dumps, we're getting values up to 2.76% copper with excellent silver credits up to 25 grams per ton and gold credits up to 0.67 grams per ton uh, gold. So underlying all this uh, silver oxide mineralization, could there be a porphyry-related deposit, which was never really talked about, similar to what Nevada Copper is mining just to the north of us at their Pumpkin Hollow deposit called um, uh, outside of Yarrington, Nevada. So uh, we're going to be doing some uh, evaluation of that uh, potential, and that's uh, very highly prospective, but could also be extremely additive. So for the rest of this year, what we're doing at Candelaria, we're going to be doing another round of drilling. We're going to do metallurgical testing on the pit extension material and the heap leach material. And the goal is to get an economic study out by the end of the year. We're going to be doing a little bit more work on potential high-grade underground resources for future extraction, perhaps wrapping down from the base of the pit. And then we're going to be uh, testing uh, essentially for is there an underground porphyry related system, which would 
dramatically change the nature of Candelaria uh, because of the recent uptick in the interest in copper and projected future shortages, not only in copper, but in silver as well. So that's Candelaria. And Greg, uh, before we leave Candelaria, so just so investors should expect, there's going to be news flow, uh, drill results yet to be released, and then another drill program before the economic study all this year. Yeah, and then metallurgical work as uh, we move on, right? And, and maybe you uh, want so, to lift up the press release about the gentleman you hired to oversee the Met work? That's true. Yeah, no, we just um, uh, put out a press release uh, and I uh, said you can go on to Stockwatch or whatever source you uh, go to or go to our website. It'll be on there. We hired a fellow by the name of uh, Len Harris, who has a very uh, extensive and exhaustive uh, resume. Uh, he's been around the industry for years, a uh, metallurgist uh, who's going to help us out with our metallurgical studies. But not only on top of that, he's received all sorts of Boards. He's worked for major companies, including Newmont, uh, um, uh, Cerro de Pasco in Peru, uh, uh, Mount Oz and Mines in Australia. And um, he knows absolutely everybody in the industry, received multiple awards. And uh, he's already been a very, uh, uh, he's already been very helpful with respect to some of the advice he's giving us with respect to moving forward with the development of the Candelaria, particularly the heaps, because he has a lot of heap leach material. Um, experience as well. Excellent. Huh. All right. So we're so, moving on to Cherokee here? or Yeah, ahead. we'll move on to Cherokee in eastern Nevada. Um, an interesting project. Uh, we, um, in essence, went out and did a little bit of research, and we found in one of the old mining journals uh, something called Cherokee, and they talked about mining in the 1800s and the thousands of grams per ton silver. Now, this is just uh, near a town of Pioche, which is an old mining camp, and Pioche started in the 1800s, and they started in near-surface epithermal silver and gold rich veins but when they got down deeper into the host limestones they uh, got into carbonate replacement deposits with copper lead zinc silver and gold so that said Cherokee uh, we went and we looked at it and we found a series of vein systems um, that went outwards from the old Cherokee mine and we traced them for over 12 kilometers or nine miles along strike and they're pretty continuous on surface which is quite intriguing for us now the only area that was ever drilled on the property was in the very southeast corner of the property. And um, they drilled that in the 1980s and uh, 1970s for a buried porphyry molybdenum deposit. And here comes up this theme of association between vein, silver, and gold and porphyry-related deposits because there's quite an association, uh, possibly, and uh, are those porphyry-related deposits really the heat and plumbing and metal uh, source for all these big, rich veins that we see on surface? So they drilled that. Uh, they never got through the overlying limestones. These are the same age limestones as the Pioche deposit to the north of us. But we went and we did a lot a lot of surface sampling. Uh, the ground was open. We staked it. We have 100%. We bought out the old patents and an artesian water well. So we do have 100% of everything. And um, we started doing some uh, interesting sampling on the vein systems themselves at the Cherokee area, very high grade silver and copper, and at the hidden treasure down to the uh, southeast end of the vein system, gold's coming into the system. And if you look at the Cherokee area, you'll see multiple um, values, uh, very high silver and copper. For instance, we're seeing values up to 1,100 grams per ton silver and 2.3% copper and multiple other ones in the hundreds of grams per ton silver range. These veins have never been drilled and most of the interesting samples are on the old patented claims. So we want to get in there later this year and drill some of these uh, targets on the patented claims because the permit is, is Permitting is extremely uh, uh, easy on the patented claims. Uh, down at the hidden treasure, I mentioned that uh, gold's coming into the system, but copper's disappearing. So we think that if we are in one of these classic epithermal systems, we're higher up in the 
uh, system here. Multiple veins over a good width. Uh, we haven't done a, a near enough sampling, but we want to get back and do some more detailed sampling in there this year to see whether we can upgrade this to a drill target as well. And then, of course, uh, we did fly the project at a big airborne magnetometer survey. And interesting enough, in the southeast corner where they did the drilling for the buried porphyry is an extreme mag high, which could be representative of that underground buried intrusive. And on surface, we're seeing all sorts of zones of alteration and mineralization and big, huge veins along these northwest trending structures. And as I said, we want to do some more surface mapping and sampling, particularly in the hidden treasure, Johnny area. Can we upgrade that to drill targets? Uh, and let's get in and see whether we can uh, trace those rich silver copper veins at Cherokee to depth by doing some drilling on those patents later this year. So that's Cherokee and where we want to go with that gun. Excellent. Okay. And then our, we're heading over to Arizona now, right? And this is the one that kind of had those eye-popping results that you uh, even had at the PDAC a couple of years ago. Yeah, it's a pretty crazy uh, system, and um, we're just starting to get a handle on and understanding it, and um, uh, this will be a potential uh, drill program this year as well, and I'll talk about that, but uh, just to put it in perspective to those listeners who aren't familiar with this, it's just outside the town of Globe, uh, uh, Arizona, which is to the east of Phoenix. Globe is a huge porphyry copper producing area. All the big companies are there, Freeport MacMoran, uh, BHP, Rio Tinto, big production uh, uh, centers, and uh, good local mining talent in the town of Globe. Just to the northeast of Globe is an old silver camp, and they talked about mining some of these uh, old rich vein deposits with native silver in them in, in the 1800s, early 1900s. Well, some prospectors came to us, and they said, we've got this property. There's not much outcrop in it, uh, but we're finding all these little silver fragments. So they went back up with their metal detectors up an old creek bed, and uh, they uncovered some huge silver fragments about a meter to a meter and a half down below the surface. And um, the reason they weren't discovered before is because they were buried and they were only discovered by the metal detectors. So they went and they found one that weighed in at 417 pounds. Um, interesting video of how they got it out, uh, out, out to, uh, uh, of the uh, site, but uh, that's for another day. But 417 pounds, we actually didn't sample it because it is a collector's item. We were displaying them at the Tucson Rock and Gem Show a couple of years ago. But um, we did some specific gravity measurements determinations on it, and it was estimated to contain over 70% silver. So very, very rich silver fragments. The thing that we noticed about them as well is they're extremely angular. They're unabraded. That means they haven't traveled very far from their source. So we went back and we looked at it. The project is only about a 20 minute drive maximum from downtown Globe. Good access, there's old silver producing uh, mines to the Northeast right along the main regional trend. Big porphyry copper, again, here comes this porphyry high grade vein association, which is intriguing to us as well. But the prospectors did give us some samples that we did analyze, some smaller ones. And those samples contained abundant native silver. Now, the Arizona geologist has dated these samples, and he's dated them to be Precambrian in age, which is extremely old. And the only other place that we see this type of rich silver mineralization in North America is a place called Cobalt, Ontario, where you used to have old cobalt silver veins in Precambrian rocks, and that camp produced over 450 million ounces of silver. Do we have something similar here? We analyzed this one sample, which had all that native silver in it, and it came back an eye-popping 459,000 grams per ton silver, or 14,500 ounces per ton. Now, our job is because we've entered into an agreement whereby we can acquire 100% interest in this project, our job is to move forward and try and find the source 
of these rich silver vein fragments. We've done quite a bit of work on the project and in the area where that 417 pound vein fragment was found, upslope along that dry creek bed, we find by doing surface geophysics, airborne geophysics, and soil geochemistry. Very interesting potential veins and structures. We've applied for a drill permit, particularly in the area uh, of the 417 vein. And we're going to go in as soon as we get that permit. Uh, might take another couple of months, but as soon as we get that permit, we want to go in and start drilling. Can we find the source? We also have other targets. There's an old uh, mine called the Mexican mine with decent silver values there. But what's intriguing is to the north of us, we're finding additional areas with silver fragments. And to the south, this is where the porphyry model comes in again, is we're finding on the veins to the south, which is right across the valley. You can see all the big porphyry copper workings across the valley. But we're finding these veins host not only high-grade silver, but they have gold, copper, lead, zinc, and molybdenum, and our neighbors immediately on our western boundary have entered into a joint venture with South 32 out of Australia, and they're currently drilling for a porphyry-related deposit. So do we have the makings of extremely high-grade silver veins with unheard of values, plus a porphyry target as well? Stay tuned, and that's what we're going to be working on. So lots of work this year. Lots of news flow. We still um, uh, have about uh, 12 million in our treasury. Um, we did um, financing last year, 9.5 million, of which Eric Sprott, renowned famed investor here in Canada, he put in five of the 9.5 million. That was the third time that he had invested into our company. So he's been a good long-term shareholder. Uh, we've had lots of uh, warrants that are all in the money being exercised. That continually tops up our treasury. We sold off those Mexican uh, assets that helped top up the treasury. So uh, we still have about 12 million and uh, we're moving forward um, as quickly as we can um, in the current environment uh, to uh, develop all three of these projects. Well, Greg, also you've started, made my though. job easy. You've done a great job and you made my <laughs> job easy today. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Okay. So um, it, it basically, uh, any, anything else we should clarify or is that, that pretty much brings us up to speed on where we're at? Yeah, just stay tuned. Uh, you know, we got some more drill samples coming out on the Candelaria project from that 15,000 meter program. Labs are a bit slow, so I think it's going to be another three, four weeks before we get them out. Um, but we'll get them out as quickly as we can. Um, stay tuned for when we get that permit to drill. Things are a little bit slower than Arizona than they are in Nevada. And um, so, but when we do get that permit, um, uh, interesting enough, the county that we're drilling in is one of the busiest counties with respect to getting permits out. So I think the government is a bit, uh, shall we say, overloaded with respect to getting this out. Uh, but once we do get it, we'll get in and do some drilling. Hopefully we can uh, have some success there, but we've got lots of other targets to go for as well. And then later this year, we'll get into the patents on Cherokee and we'll be doing some drilling there as well. And then if everything works out with respect to silver, I think, um, you know, everybody's, uh, I think, thinking that uh, with this uh, excessive stimulus, uh, there's going to be massive inflationary pressures coming to bear, and that's going to be good for uh, precious metals plus uh, supply demand side for silver increases in usages of silver, particularly in the solar industry, the electrical vehicle industry, and all of the computing cell phone technologies all use silver in their circuitry, not to mention the vanity uh, issues such as mirrors um, and uh, useful utility, utilitarian uh, uses such as silverware, all in the upswing, and yet new mines are hard to find and good silver mines are near impossible to find because silver is generally a byproduct of other mining endeavors such as copper, lead, zinc, etc. So uh, I think uh, things bode well for silver, uh, uh, shall we say, buffs around the world. Uh, I think the uh, future in the near, mid and long term looks very promising. All right, well, we'll leave it at that. 
Website again is silverone.com, trades in Toronto, in the States, and also overseas in Europe. Ticker symbols for all that are on the screen if you're watching on YouTube or in the show notes if you're listening in audio form only. Greg, really appreciate this update. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks, Bill. Always a pleasure. 